اشهد محمد ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions whomsoever allah guides there is none to misguide and whomsoever allah leaves to go astray there is none to guide and i testify that allah alone is worthy of being worshiped and that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger after that the best speech is the book of allah and the best guidance is the guidance of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all the affairs are the matters that are newly introduced into the religion and every newly introduced matter into the religion of islam is a bid'ah an innovation all of the innovations are misguidance all the misguidance is going astray and all the going astray is in the fire my brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh the topic of today's discussion or talk is pray before you are prayed upon and mashallah what a beautiful title for a very important subject and the first thing we want to do is to remind all of the brothers and sisters of the reality of the nature of this life that if we are muslim then inshallah all of us will reach that time when we will be prayed upon when our body will be laid out wrapped in a shroud and that the funeral prayer will be performed not by us but for us death is inevitable death is something that nobody is going to escape from it doesn't matter who you are how powerful how rich it doesn't matter what nation or what tribe or what is the color of your skin or the language you speak it doesn't matter whether you are pious or impious indeed brothers and sisters whether you are young or old because death can come to any one of us at any time indeed we should not even imagine that having begun this day that we will reach the end of it nor we should imagine that if we begin the night that we will reach the end of it we should imagine that death and we should realize that death can come to us at any time at any moment and what an event death is brothers and sisters what a terrifying moment what an awesome spectacle when we reach our graves when the angels of the angels and the angel of death malik al maut comes to take our soul how will our condition be then brothers and sisters will our soul come out of our body willingly happily 
as if death was a welcome friend that has been away too long. As the Prophet ﷺ described the soul of the believer, how it will come out from the body, as if you can imagine the small drop of water, the dew that comes on the leaves in the morning. You just touch the leaf and that dew drop falls in your hand. This is how the soul of the believer comes out. Or will it be that our soul will have to be ripped from our body, tearing the muscles and the veins. As the Prophet ﷺ described it like thorns, like cotton, that is on a, a, a stick of thorns. You see how you will have to rip it? This is how the soul of the wicked and the sinful person will be reluctant. And if our soul is one that has clung to this world, then surely our soul will wish to cling to our body. If our soul was one that looked to the Akhirah, that looked forward to the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the life to come, then it will be willing to leave the body. And brothers and sisters, the grave is a place where we are all alone. Indeed, the company there will be initially the two angels who will question us in the grave. They will ask us and question us severely. And what is it, brothers and sisters, that will bring light to our grave? What is it that will bring space to our grave? What is it that will bring the day of 50,000 years, the day of judgment, the day of standing, the day of fear and the day of terror? What is it that will make that day short? What is it, brothers and sisters, that when we reach a bridge that is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword, that is stretched over the hellfire, what is it that will carry us swiftly across that bridge to the other side? What is it, brothers and sisters, that will cause us to be recognized by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when we go towards a pond, al kawthar the pond, the hawd, the pond, in which is a drink that is cooler than snow and whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. That if you drink of it, you will never be thirsty again. What will make us recognized by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So what are the things, brothers and sisters, that are going to give us relief on that day? What is it that is going to cause us to enter into paradise? Except our deeds. Except our deeds. It is our deeds that will be the cause for our graves to be full of light, to be spacious, to be as if it is a garden from paradise. It is our deeds that will cause that long and terrible day to seem as if it is short. It is our deeds that will carry us swiftly across the bridge that is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. It is the marks of making wudu, of the ritual ablution that will cause us to be noticed and identified by the Prophet wasallam at the banks of al kawthar the pond. It is nothing except our deeds, brothers and sisters. It is nothing except our deeds. And through our deeds, the grace and the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon us and that we enter into paradise. And the angels will say, enter to paradise because of what you used to do. O oh, brothers and sisters, therefore we have to think and we have to ask ourselves, what is the greatest of all the deeds? What is the most important of all the deeds? After bearing witness and testifying that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah 
and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger the most important and the greatest and the noblest of all the deeds before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing except as salah the prayer as salah the prayer the obligatory prayer the ritual prayer the prayer that we have to perform five times a day the prayer is the first of the acts of worship that was legislated in Islam and made obligatory upon the Muslims and brothers and sisters it is the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will ask us about on the day of judgment it is the first thing Allah will ask us about on the day of judgment this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us the first thing that Allah will ask about on the day of judgment is the prayer and Allah will ask the angels to look at the records of the deeds to see that if all of your prayers your obligatory prayers have been performed and if there is something missing and there is some negligence or there is some shortcoming in the prayer which could either be because you missed it or it could be because you did not make wudu beforehand or you did not perform the prayer correctly in an acceptable manner all of this will cause loss to the obligatory prayer then Allah in His mercy and Allah is certainly the most merciful He will tell the angels to look at the extra voluntary prayers to see if there are enough voluntary prayers to make up the shortcoming in the obligatory prayers and if there are not sufficient voluntary prayers to make up for the shortcoming and obligatory prayers then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us Allah will not look at the rest of your deeds Allah will not look at the rest of your deeds if you have not performed the prayers correctly and they are not sufficient and there is a shortcoming even after looking at your voluntary prayers Allah will not look at the rest of your deeds Allah will not look at your charity He will not look at your fasting He will not look at your kindness to your parents He will not look at whether you fought jihad or not All of the other deeds will not even be looked at And that person who is deficient will go to hell The prayer brothers and sisters Is the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Will look at on the day of judgment Indeed my brothers and sisters we should know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the thing that differentiates between shirk and kufr and iman is the salah and whoever abandons it is a disbeliever is a kafir this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the difference between the one who makes partners with Allah and the one who disbelieves in Allah and the person who truly believes who has iman who has true faith the difference between these things <clears throat> is the prayer what differentiates between the Muslim and the kafir is the prayer and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he warned that whoever abandons it it is as if they have left Islam and they have become a disbeliever this is the covenant between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the this is the covenant between us and them the prophet said the prayer
and brothers and sisters some of the scholars of Islam and including the Sahab, the Sahaba including the Sahaba some of the Sahaba they used to consider and they used to say that we did not consider the abandoning of any good deed to expel you from Islam to expel one from Islam except the abandoning of prayer we did not use to consider that leaving any good deed would take you out of Islam except the abandoning of prayer and there are many scholars who used to consider and today consider that the person brothers and sisters who abandons the prayer willfully chooses to abandon the prayer has left Islam some scholars say and they differ some saying whoever abandons the obligation of prayer meaning whoever does not believe that prayer is an obligation but other scholars have said no this is not correct they have said that the person who stops praying this person is a kafir and they base that on what the sahaba said and what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the extent indeed that some scholars said that whoever leaves one prayer on purpose becomes a disbeliever until they start to pray again subhanallah brothers and sisters and they took this to the extent that if they say that a person um, uh, someone who claims to be a muslim abandons the prayer they said that this person is a murtad an apostate that you do not pray the funeral prayer for that person that person is not allowed to be buried with the muslims that you do not inherit from that person because the believer does not inherit from the kafir that if someone abandons prayer then the marriage between the one who prays and the one who abandons the prayer is invalid their marriage is invalid because the believer is not allowed to be married to a murtad an apostate subhanallah and if this person, person slaughters meat it is not allowed to eat it and according to these scholars that their meat is unlawful and that they are worse than Jews and Christians subhanallah because they have according to the opinion of these scholars become murtad they have apostatized and they have chosen to leave the religion of Islam brothers and sisters whether this opinion is absolutely the correct opinion or not it should be enough for anybody to think and reflect that abandoning the obligatory prayer is one of the most heinous crimes the greatest sins and transgressions that the human being can commit indeed after shirk abandoning the prayer is considered to be perhaps the greatest sin or it is in fact the greatest sin after shirk is abandoning the prayer brothers and sisters therefore the prayer is not something that any of us should take lightly this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has told us in his book to guard strictly the prayer especially the middle prayer and stand before allah with obedience guard strictly brothers and sisters allah has ordered us guard strictly your habit of prayers especially the middle prayer the middle prayer is the asr prayer indeed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said 
that whoever missed their asr prayer, then they have nullified their good deeds. The good deeds have been nullified. Your good deeds are invalid. It is like you have wiped out all your good deeds just by abandoning the asr prayer. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, and he told us to pray the asr prayer in the earliest part of its time. Not to leave it, but to pray it in the earliest part of its time. Because of the great calamity that would come to the Muslim if they were to miss the asr prayer. How many times, brothers and sisters, do we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned in the Qur'an, and He told us in the Qur'an to establish the prayer. Establish the prayer. <coughs> many times, brothers and sisters, Allah is reminding us again and again and again to establish the prayer. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَعْضُهُ الْيَتِيمِ فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُسَّلِينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Have you seen the person who denies the deen? Meaning either the day of judgment or the religion of Islam. Have you seen the person who denies the religion? Who denies the reality of the day of judgment. This is the one who repels the orphan. So woe to the Muslims. Wailul lil Muslim. Wail, they say, is a valley in the hellfire. A special valley with a special punishment. Wailul lil Muslim. Woe to those Muslims. Who? are lazy and they are not conscientious about their prayer. This is a very grave matter, brothers and sisters. It is a sure sign of hypocrisy, of claiming in your heart to have iman, but in reality, your actions tell something else. Your actions say something else. You say with your tongue, I am a believer. You say with your tongue, you are Muslim. But one of the clear signs of the hypocrites is their laziness in the prayer. Especially the Fajr prayer and the Isha prayer. These are very, very hard prayers for the Munafik. Even the hypocrite in the time of the Prophet had to pray. It is a sign of hypocrisy, brothers and sisters, that you are lazy and inattentive about the prayer. Subhanallah. Who is the one, you tell me, who when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to bow down, Allah gave him a command to bow down, brothers and sisters. Who is the one who disobeyed the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is shaitan. Allah ordered him to bow down to Adam. Along with the angels, Allah ordered him to bow down before Adam and he refused. And Allah is ordering us to bow down before him. To worship Him, to pray. Are we not therefore merely following shaitan and his footsteps? Are we not therefore, brothers and sisters, merely following the footsteps of shaitan, listening to him and obeying his command when we abandon the prayer and we are lazy about the prayer? O oh, brothers and sisters, do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. He is a sworn enemy to you. He has sworn to take us with him to the hellfire. How could we be lazy about such a thing? How could we be lazy about such a thing that is so important, that is so essential, 
That is such a requirement of our Islam. And brothers and sisters, the prayer is something that is so beautiful. It is such a blessed and beneficial thing. What better protection do we have? What better protection do we have? What better means do we have of protecting ourselves from sins and transgressions except the prayer? Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He told us in the Quran in Surah Al Ankabut that verily, certainly, the prayer, as salah, verily the prayer protects you from fawahish and munkar, the open sins and evil. Prayer is what protects you from these things. It is that time, brothers and sisters, that we stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we remember our Lord regularly at stated times as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that the prayer is at stated times. We stand up before Allah at stated times, at certain inf- intervals, and we remember Him. And we seek His help. And we call upon Him. And we remember that we have a Lord who has created us to worship Him. And that verily in the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find rest. And so this prayer has an effect, a great effect, in keeping us away from sins, in keeping us away from evil. This is one of the great benefits of prayer. This is why, brothers and sisters, when someone wants to become Muslim, Alhamdulillah, we had a new brother last night, mashallah, who took shahada, subhanallah, last night after the lecture. Hope he's here today. You see, in the, he was worried. I said, what's preventing you from being Muslim? He said, you know, all those things you talked about, how am I going to be able to do them? How am I going to be able to leave all those sins? How am I? I said, don't worry about that. I said, do you believe? That there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger? Yes, I believe that. I said, why don't you just say what's on your, with your tongue what is on your heart. And then after that, just begin to establish the prayer. Begin to establish the prayer. And everything will come your way. Believe me. Alhamdulillah, Islam is like that. Beautiful, step by step by step. And this is my experience, brothers and sisters. You know, I really tasted this in my life. Because between me knowing that Islam was the truth and me practicing Islam and really being a Muslim, there was a gap of two years. And really I can say from my own experience and my knowledge in life that there is really no difference between someone who just says, I'm a Muslim, I believe in Islam, and they don't pray, and the kafir. There's no difference. That happened to me. I used to say, I'm Muslim. I believe in Islam. I used to say that while I'm drunk at a party. Yes, I'll be drunk, and I'd say, I wish I could tell you more about Islam, but I'm too drunk. Yes. What was the difference? I still ate pork, I still drank alcohol, I was still fornicating, I was still doing all of those things, only I said I believed in Islam. What, what is that? What is it then? What? I recognize it to be the truth. But did it change my life one single little bit? No. In fact, the truth is that knowing Islam was the truth and not acting upon it and not implementing it made my life worse, not better. Because before I lived in a state of what you could say, you know, innocence. I didn't know. But when you know the truth, you know what your Lord Allah wants from you. You have come to the true religion and the realization of the true way to lead your life. But you turn away from that. Then surely, brothers and sisters, every day is a torment. Every day is a torture. 
Every day that you live is going to be worse than the next because you know the truth and you're not living according to it. But subhanallah, when I started to pray, everything changed. All the things I used to do, it was not even, I could say, it was hardly, there was hardly even an effort to try to give it up. There were things that I didn't even know they were haram, but subhanallah, my heart felt so uncomfortable with them. I didn't know they were haram because I didn't have the knowledge. But my heart felt uncomfortable. This is how the prayer can transform your life. And this is my advice to all the brothers and sisters. Subhanallah. To realize the important effect of the prayer in changing your life. And if you wonder to yourself and you think to yourself, why do I find it so hard to abandon the sins? Why do I find it so hard to change myself? Look to your prayer. Look to your prayer. Ask yourself, how is your prayer? And I am sure you will find that if you are finding it difficult to keep away from the sins, the fawahish and the munkar, you will look to your prayer and you will find, brothers and sisters, either you are lazy about it, or your prayer is deficient. Maybe many of us, and this is the problem, that our prayer has become just a ritual. Just some movements, just some actions that we perform and some words that we say. And we don't really know what is the meaning of these words. And we don't even think about what is the benefit of these actions. It has become a habit. And this is the case for people maybe who have been praying for a long time. It has become a habit. There is no khushur in the prayer. And this is something, brothers and sisters, very, very important that we have neglected. Because the prayer, brothers and sisters, is not just about performing some actions and saying some words. Subhanallah, it is not about that. The prayer has a spirit, the prayer has an essence, it has a purpose. If you look, subhanallah, to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did He say about Drinking alcohol and prayer. Do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He was prohibiting the consumption of alcohol, first by saying that there is some good in it, and there is some evil in it, but the evil of it is much greater than the good. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, do not approach the prayer in a state of intoxication. Allah forbade the Muslims from approaching the prayer while they are intoxicated. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally forbade the drinking or the taking of intoxicants altogether in any way, shape or form. But what is the reason that Allah gave? That you should not approach the prayer in a state of intoxication. Why? Because you may not know what you are saying. You may not know what you are saying. You will not understand what you are saying. And subhanAllah, some ulama, they extracted from this a proof. And from this they said, it is wajib, meaning it is an obligation upon every single Muslim to know at least that amount of Arabic so that they understand what they are saying in their prayer. Because it is not allowed to go to the prayer and approach the prayer and to not know what you are saying. You must understand the words you are saying. You must know what you are saying. Because the prayer, brothers and sisters, is a communication between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you stand in front of Allah for the prayer and you have purified yourself and you make the takbir and you enter into the salah and you are facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and Allah He turns towards you and Allah does not turn away from you until you turn away from Him. And if we are standing in front of Allah and we are facing our Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has turned towards us and we start looking here and we start looking there and scratching and doing this and doing all and we have no attentiveness filling with our beards and whatever subhanallah and Allah says is there something more important than me is there something more important than me brothers and sisters is there something more important than Allah is there something more worthy of your attention than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah think about that you look at some insignificant thing and you have really, you have turned away from Allah. And Allah, He turns away from you. You are in front of your Lord. Subhanallah. When you come to the prayer, you are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Malik al Mawt, the King of Kings. Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of the worlds. Subhanallah, the one who is far removed from all imperfections. How would it be? How would it be? Think about this. How would it be if you went to a king, an earthly king, a king of this world, and you presented to this king a gift of a dead servant? A dead servant. You give him, this king is a gift, a lifeless servant. A servant that is dead. Subhanallah, what is that? What gift is that? If you went to stand in front of the king, and the king was speaking, and you went there, and you made all the effort to get there, and then you thought about everything else, and you were not listening to one single word this king was saying to you. You would not do that brothers and sisters. You would not do that. Subhanallah. But when we stand in front of Allah, really you know it. You stand in front of Allah, you go Allahu Akbar, and you start to remember everything. Everything. Except Allah. Subhanallah. One scholar, he once said to somebody, the man said, I have lost something. I lost this thing and I have been looking for it and I am looking for it. And I can't find it. So the scholar he said to him, pray to Raqqa. Pray to Raqqa. So the man, he started Allahu Akbar. Maybe he didn't even finish Fatiha. And then, subhanallah, he remembered. He left his prayer and he went off and he went to find the thing that he was. <laughs> yeah. So he went back to the scholar. He said, subhanallah, he said, I did what you said. I prayed to Rakha, I hadn't even got so far, and then I remembered. And the scholar said, I knew that shaitan would not leave you to pray to Rakha, except that he will come to you and he will tell you where that thing was. Subhanallah. Shaitan will not leave you to pray to Rakha. This is the reality. Because shaitan, he knows the benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in as salah how it is a means of us keeping away from evil. How it is a cause for us to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us to seek help in patience and prayer. To seek help in patience and prayer. Shaitan knows brothers and sisters, that whoever is going to stand in front of Allah and their wudu is correct and they pray to raka with real khushur, with real attentiveness, then that person will come away from that prayer if they could do that with their sins forgiven, all of them, like a newborn child. Subhanallah. And this is one of the great benefits of prayer, brothers and sisters. The obligatory prayer, the salah, the obligatory prayer is a means for our sins to be forgiven. Subhanallah, our sins to be forgiven. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said to his companions and he mentioned about this, if one of you 
Between your house and your place of work there was a stream. And you passed through this stream five times a day. Would there be any dirt left on you? And they said, no messenger of Allah, surely we would be clean. This is like the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ said. The prayer is like this. This is how the prayer expiates for the sins. It is one of the means, the one of the good deeds, and one of the greatest good deeds that we can do. And a sincere repentance, brothers and sisters, is, is, one, that is, is one that is combined with righteous action. As you did evil deeds, you do righteous actions to recompense for the evil that you have done. And prayer, brothers and sisters, is one of the greatest means, one of the greatest means in order to get the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things, brothers and sisters, that we have neglected about the prayer is attending the prayer in jama'ah. Subhanallah. Attending the prayer in the jama'ah, going to the mosque. This is for the men especially, the women Allah has excused them and not obliged them to pray in the mosque. In fact, their prayer in their home is better than the prayer in the mosque. But the men, to attend jama'ah, to make that effort to pray in congregation. Indeed, this is one of the conditions of the prayer really being completely correct. Part of establishing the prayer... Part of establishing aqimus salah, part of establishing the prayer, is in reality establishing it in the mosques. Indeed, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned that if three of you were to be living in a village and you did not come together to establish the prayer, then shaitan has got hold of you. Shaitan has got hold of you. And this is one of the things, again, that we find the Muslims have become very, very neglectful of. And another thing, brothers and sisters, that is of such great benefit concerning the prayer, and it is the best type of prayer after the obligatory prayer, and that is the tahajjud. That is the qiyam. That is the prayer in the night after the Isha prayer, especially that prayer that is performed in the last third of the night. Subhanallah, the superiority of this prayer, the benefit of this prayer. I remember reading about one of the, I think it was one of the Tabi'een, he could not understand. He couldn't understand how there were people who followed a religion. And this religion told them that in the last third of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven. And He says, is there anybody asking forgiveness so I can forgive them? Does anyone have any need so I can fulfill it? Subhanallah. And that they do not take the benefit of that. That they do not take the benefit of that. How could it be? Brothers and sisters. How long do we think our life is? How much time do we imagine that we have on this earth? How are we going to reap the rewards how are we going to acquire the good deeds? Subhanallah, that prayer in the deepest part of the night when everyone is sleeping and it is just you before your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one to watch you, no one to see you. So it is a good time to be achieve sincerity, ikhlas. It's not something you're going to be doing, inshallah, showing off to people. It is you in the privacy of your room or your house. You are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You forsake your bed. And you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And you ask him forgiveness and he will forgive you. You ask him for your needs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will feel shy not to provide them to you. You ask Allah, he's going to feel shy not to give them to you, subhanallah. This is our deen, this is our religion, this beautiful religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Brothers and sisters, you can't imagine. Subhanallah, the religions I have been through. Christianity, with their mass, their benediction, their going and confessing to priests, everything done through Jesus or through this saint or through that saint. And God is hardly there in the picture at all. Hinduism, again, worshipping idols, all these intermediaries. But Allah has told us that He wants us to call upon Him alone. In fact, it is hateful to Him that you should call upon something that has no power, no benefit to help you or to harm you. Why should you call upon a human being, whether he is a prophet or a righteous person, who himself is seeking closeness to Allah? Allah wants you, demands that you should stand in front of Him alone. Subhanallah. How beautiful, how pure, how simple. How Allah has honored us. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us by giving us this salah. Let me finish brothers and sisters by reading something subhanallah from Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyah. Very beautiful thing that he says here. He talks about the five degrees of prayer. The five degrees of prayer. And he says, with respect to prayer, there are five levels of people. With respect to the prayer, there are five levels of people. So the lowest level of person is that person who does not take care of the prayer. He does not make the wudu properly. He or she is not careful about praying the prayer in its time. And in, they are not careful about the essential elements of the prayer. They do not take care of the prayer. This is the first level, the lowest level. And the second level, brothers and sisters, is the person who keeps to the times and the rules and the essential elements of the prayer. But this person is taken away in the prayer by distractions. They are constantly distracted during the prayer. And this individual lacks the inner strength to resist these distractions. So, it is a prayer with its essential elements complete in terms of the rituals, but inwardly the prayer is not really present. This is the second level. The third level is the person who follows the essential rules and the essential requirements, but they are now fighting the distractions. They are trying to resist these distractions. And this person is preoccupied with fighting shaitan in the prayer. Fighting his enemy. Trying to achieve attentiveness. And this is what the prayer is concerned with, with this individual. So this prayer is a type of combat or type of jihad, an inward jihad for this individual. So this is the person, person whose prayer is in a state of jihad, inward jihad that is. And the fourth level is the person who when they pray, they complete its requirements, they fulfill all the necessary conditions. And the heart of this individual is very attentive concerning Fulfilling all the essential requirements of the prayer. In fact, this person, their whole concern is making sure that the prayer is performed the way it should be. Indeed, according to the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ performed the prayer. So really this person, 
This is the person who has achieved the level of khushu'a. They have this attentiveness. They are completely absorbed with praying the prayer in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to. And they are concerned with worshipping Allah and that is, what absorb, uh, that is what occupies that person's heart. And the fifth level, this is the highest level now of the person standing in the prayer. He has all or she has all the same things as the fourth person. But in addition, brothers and sisters, this person places their heart before his Lord. And it is as if this person is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They pray as if they are seeing Allah. They pray as if they are beholding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if they were actually standing in front of Him. This is the prayer, the best and the most complete type of prayer. And for this person, all distractions disappear. And as Ibn al qayyim he mentions, the difference between this person's prayer and the prayer of everybody else is as vast as the distance between the heavens and the earth. For he is occupied only with his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer. And he finds this, brothers and sisters, the source of gladness. This is what he finds. The prayer, gladness and happiness is in the prayer. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say that the, 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 my source of gladness is in the prayer. And then he mentions about these five people. He says the first person, the first level, this person will be punished. This person will be punished. The second person admonished. He will be admonished. He will be told off and he will be admonished for what that person has done. That is the sec- for the second level. The third will be redeemed. That is the one who made the effort and who was struggling. The fourth will be rewarded. That is the person, as we mentioned, who has performed all its aspects correctly. And the fifth person, as he mentioned, will be brought near to his Lord. The fifth person will be brought near to his Lord. For his source of gladness has been placed in prayer. And whoever is gladdened gladdened by the prayer in this world will be gladdened by nearness to Allah in the life to come. And he who finds gladness in Allah gathers all the goodness of this life and the next. But whoever does not do that, brothers and sisters, leaves this life as a loser. So brothers and sisters, we have to understand that not only is the prayer a ritual that we perform, the prayer is a deep spiritual experience. It is a time and a place where we should realize that we are in fact standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the state, brothers and sisters, that we have to try and achieve. And alhamdulillah, if we are able to achieve that state, then indeed we will be well on the path to defeating shaitan, both both in our private lives and collectively also as a nation. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.